on World News Tonight. Intensifying attacks. Mariupol has been reduced to ashes by the continued onslaught of Russian troops as the two nations battle it out in the front line. Civilians stranded in the city pray for safety. Economic crisis. As global leaders shun Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Russian citizens are feeling the squeeze of the sanctions, causing an alarming rise in the prices of everyday necessities. Surging cases. The COVID pandemic may be preparing for a major comeback across the globe as Europe puts its guard down in responding to rising infections. And a fiery fiesta. Spain sees giant sculptures turn into infernos in rights to welcome another spring season. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top stories today still begins with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ashes of the dead land is what Mariupol is currently being labeled as. Officials decry the intense military onslaught carried out by Russian troops in order to capture the country's symbolic region, despite there being thousands of civilians still stranded within the area. Intense Russian airstrikes are turning the Ukrainian city of Mariupol into ashes of a dead land, the city's council said on Tuesday. These satellite images, released by Maxa Technologies, show extensive damage to apartments and factory buildings in the port city. Hundreds of thousands of people are believed to be trapped inside buildings with no access to food, water or power. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky accuses Russia of thwarting attempts to create a stable humanitarian corridor. In a video address late on Tuesday, he said that peace talks with Moscow have been confrontational but were moving forward. We are continuing to work at different levels to encourage Russia to move towards peace, to end this brutal war. Ukrainian representatives are participating in talks that are taking place virtually every day. It's very difficult, sometimes confrontational, but step by step we are moving forward. With the war now in its 28th day, Maripol has become the focus. The southern city lies on the Sea of Azov and its capture would allow Russia to link areas in the east held by pro-Russian separatists. Kiev has accused Moscow of deporting residents of Maripol and separatist-held areas of Ukraine to Russia. Moscow has denied targeting civilians and forcing people to leave, saying it is taking in refugees. Russia's President Vladimir Putin calls the invasion a special military operation designed to demilitarize Ukraine and replace its pro-Western leadership. The continued fighting will form the backdrop of a new round of diplomacy this week. US President Joe Biden is visiting Brussels and is expected to announce new sanctions against Russia. The Wall Street Journal reported that the US is preparing sanctions on more than 300 members of Russia's lower house of parliament. So far, Russia has failed to capture any major Ukrainian city with a swift offensive. That's led to concerns from Western powers that the conflict could escalate further, even to a nuclear war. As big wigs are battling it out economically, small-time citizens across Russia are feeling the squeeze of the hefty sanctions imposed on the country, prices of everyday essentials being to show a concerning rise in price. In Pokrov, a town of just 17,000 people 60 miles east of Moscow, Western sanctions are starting to bite. Pokrov local Larissa says the price of sugar and salt is rising. Facing its gravest economic crisis for more than 20 years, Moscow has been telling citizens there is no lack of food and urging them not to panic by staples. But for some, that's fallen on deaf ears. One resident, Svetlana, purchased more than 20 pounds of sugar in the city of Vladimir, an hour away, to make sure she could preserve the berries she'll collect this summer. She says people are afraid the price will go up. In another sign of the times, a shuttered McDonald's, just one of the dozens of Western firms that has stopped its operations in Russia. Pensioner Antonina says her state pension was enough to cover her basic needs, but she expects to have to change her eating habits. She said she probably won't be able to buy fruit for some time. For Larissa, it's merely the latest setback after many periods of uncertainty.
Russia's creditors around the world are closely watching for a possible wave of defaults on the country's debt payments amidst the stringent sanctions in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. For a second time, the Russian government has managed to make its coupon payments to its international creditors, but that doesn't rule out a wave of missed payments in the coming weeks. Despite the unprecedented sanctions over its invasion of Ukraine, Russia appears to have avoided default for a second time. Reuters reports that a coupon payment to Russia's sovereign bondholders worth 66 million U.S. dollars was processed on Monday. Unlike a payment due last week, which was not payable in rubles, this bond has a ruble fallback option, meaning that Russia was able to pay in its local currency. Last Wednesday, some fears about a default were relieved after Moscow paid a combined 177 million U.S. dollars in interest on dollar-denominated bonds. After that, the Kremlin spokesman claimed Russia has all the funds necessary to prevent a default. There cannot be a default as Russia has the funds, so any default that could hypothetically happen would be entirely artificial. But the payments made so far represent only a fraction of the amount due in the next couple of weeks. Russia's central bank reserves overseas are now frozen, so it's not clear how long it can hold out. If a payment falls through, it would be Russia's first international default since the Bolshevik Revolution over a century ago. Not only is the Russian government struggling to get clearance for debt payments, default is looming for a number of Russian companies, too. Russian steelmaker Avras Group SA said Monday that it sent $18.9 million for a coupon payment, but for compliance reasons, the transaction was blocked by its correspondent bank. The Russian mining company Severstal PJSC has also reportedly been unable to pay its creditors and its grace period expires later this week. Germany is torn between making a decision to shun Russia along with the rest of the world in the energy sector and leaving citizens to go powerless due to the actions. Germany's Chancellor Scholz has taken a firm stance in putting the country first, but also working on becoming less dependent on Russian oil. Let's cross over to other Nobel News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo, who joins us now from Kleve in Germany. For more, Inuka, over to you. Yes, Shanali. Two days before the EU summit in Brussels, Chancellor Olaf Scholz rejected a halt to Russian energy deliveries to Germany and Europe. Saying the conflict could last into the long term, Scholz said sanctions needed to be withstood by EU member states. Scholz said at a joint news conference with the EU's parliament president that the country can't leave anyone out in the cold. He did, however, mention that they have decided to stop dependency on Russian coal gas and oil imports as quickly as possible and are working on this with the greatest intensity and speed. Scholz confirmed that if Germany manages a speedy diversification, then the effect of banning Russian gas imports will happen automatically. The issue of energy sanctions is expected to play a role at the EU summit on Thursday and Friday. Robert Ahmed Sola also called on all member states to pull together to help refugees echoing then-German Chancellor Angela Merkel's words in 2015. His message is that Germany can and must do this. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adder in a World News Special Correspondent Inu Kaponzo reporting from Kleve in Germany. Meanwhile, in Russia, the most major voice of opposition to the Kremlin is soon to go behind bars yet again. Alexei Navalny, uh, the Kremlin critic, has been charged by Russian courts of fraud and contempt of court in hopes of moving to a controversial figure to a higher security containment area. A Russian court found Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny guilty of large-scale fraud and contempt of court on Tuesday. He was sentenced to nine years in prison, a ruling that will keep President Vladimir Putin's most prominent opponent out of active politics for years ahead. Navalny had pled not guilty. He has dismissed the charges as being politically motivated. He is already serving a two-and-a-half-year sentence at a prison camp east of Moscow for parole violations related to charges he says were fabricated in order to thwart his political ambitions. 
Prosecutors had asked the court to send him to a maximum security penal colony for 13 years. A gaunt Navalny stood beside his lawyers as the judge read out the accusations against him. The 45-year-old seemed unfazed, looking down as he flipped through court documents. Kira Yarmish is his spokesperson. She said his team had prepared for Navalny to receive a long sentence. Navalny was jailed last year when he returned to Russia after receiving medical treatment in Germany following a poison attack with a nerve agent during a visit to Siberia in 2020. Navalny blamed Putin for the attack. The Kremlin denied involvement and said it had seen no evidence that Navalny was poisoned. Russian authorities have cast Navalny and his supporters as subversives determined to destabilize Russia with backing from the West. Navalny's opposition movement has been labelled extremist and shut down, although his supporters continue to express their political stance, including their opposition to Moscow's military intervention in Ukraine on social media. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The World Health Organization says numerous European countries have lifted their COVID-19 restrictions too brutally from extensively strict to overall careless, leading to the latest spread of the virus. This comes as the region reported over 5 million new infections during the past week. The WHO says several European countries, including Germany, France and Britain, have eased their COVID-19 restrictions too brutally. These countries are now witnessing a rise in new cases, most likely caused by the more transmissible BA2 variant, nicknamed Stealth Omicron. Speaking during a press briefing Tuesday, the WHO Europe director said the virus is on the rise in many countries in the region, namely the UK, France, Italy and Germany. The number of COVID-19 cases in Europe fell sharply after peaking in late January, but the region has been witnessing a virus resurgence since early March. Just last week alone, the WHO reported over 5.1 million new COVID-19 cases within the European region. South Africa is also easing antivirus measures, with masks no longer required when people are outdoors. The decision comes as the government prepares to lift the state of disaster and move on to the next chapter of the pandemic. Over in Asia, Japan has decided to end a COVID-19 quasi-state of emergency in all 18 affected prefectures, amid a declining trend in the number of new cases. This is the first time since early January for the country to have no emergency measures in place. The move comes as the country's daily COVID-19 tally has hovered around the 20,000 mark for two straight days. Meanwhile, China has reported over 4,000 new cases for the second straight day as its zero-COVID strategy is confronted by an Omicron wave. With a large majority of the new cases reported in the country's northeastern province of Jilin, Chinese authorities ordered late Monday a lockdown of the city of Chenyang in neighboring Liaoning province. The industrial city of 9 million is preventing residents from leaving their homes without a 48-hour negative test result. Shanghai Disneyland Resort is closed again until further notice as the city is witnessing a rise in new cases. The country's financial hub has reported a fifth consecutive daily record for locally transmitted COVID-19 cases, with over 860 cases reported Monday, up from some 730 a day earlier. The World Health Organization has also raised concerns on the environment, stating that the air quality levels have dropped at an alarming rate, stressing that no country has met the ideal standards of the air purity optimal for human survival. Not a single country managed to meet the World Health Organization's air quality standards in 2021. A survey of pollution data in over 6,000 cities showed on Tuesday. Smog even rebounded in some regions after a health crisis-related dip. The WHO recommends that average annual readings of small and hazardous airborne particles, known as PM2.5, should be no more than 5 micrograms per cubic metre. Prolonged exposure can lead to deadly diseases, including cancer and cardiac problems. The guidelines were changed last year, with the WHO saying that even low concentrations caused significant health risks. 
but only 3.4% of the surveyed cities met the standards in 2021, according to data compiled by IQ Air, a Swiss pollution technology company. As many as 93 cities saw hazardous particles at 10 times the recommended level. India's overall pollution levels worsened in 2021 and New Delhi remained the world's most polluted capital, the data showed. Andrew Gohl is a Commonwealth Scholar Fellow at the Energy and Resources Institute in the capital city. We need to have a mass awareness generation in this field which is currently missing. To, in order to create a demand for clean air. Whenever we do, whenever we ask our politicians, no one never asks for the clean air. That as a, like in the next assembly, please provide us clean air. That demand is yet to generate it from the public. Bangladesh was the most polluted country, also unchanged from the previous year, while Chad ranked second after the African country's data was included for the first time. China, which has been waging war on pollution since 2014, fell to 22nd in the rankings in 2021, down from 14th place a year earlier. In striving for a seat at the highest American court, Supreme Court pick Ketanji Brown Jackson defended herself against critical questions aimed at her by the Republican Party, standing by her previous decision as a federal judge. In your understanding, what, what does critical race theory mean? What is it? Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson, who would be the first black woman ever to serve on the high court, fielded some tough questions on Tuesday from Republican senators on day two of her confirmation hearing. It doesn't come up in my work as a judge. It's never something that I've uh, studied or relied on, and it wouldn't be something that I would rely on if I was on the Supreme Court. Republicans pressed her on issues related to race, with Senator Ted Cruz grilling her about a children's book on racism available at a private school for which she is a board member. On page... 33, it asks the question, can we send white people back to Europe? That's on 33. That's what's being given to eight and nine years old. Senator, I have not reviewed any of those books, any of those ideas. They don't come up in my work as a judge, which I'm respectfully here to address. Jackson also rejected claims from Republicans that she has been overly lenient towards some criminal defendants, particularly those convicted of child pornography. As a mother and a judge who has had to deal with these cases, I was thinking that nothing could be further from the truth. While Democrats praised her work as a public defender, some Republicans have criticized her for representing detainees at Guantanamo Bay, work Jackson defended as consistent with American values of fairness. That's what makes our system the best in the world. That's what makes us exemplary. Nominated for the lifetime seat by President Joe Biden in February to succeed retiring Liberal Justice Stephen Breyer, Jackson has served since last year as a federal appellate judge after eight years as a federal district court judge. Her confirmation would not change the court's ideological balance. It has a 6-3 to three conservative majority. But at age 51, her presence would allow Biden to freshen the court's liberal block with a justice young enough to serve for decades. A simple majority is needed for confirmation in an evenly divided Senate. With Vice President Kamala Harris as the tiebreaker, Jackson would get the job if Democrats remain united in the vote. South Korea has now legally committed to achieving carbon neutrality by the year 2050. President Moon signing the Carbon Neutrality Act into law, which will also require the country to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by the end of this decade. The Carbon Neutrality Act is now officially a law in South Korea, with President Moon Jae-in signing the bill during a cabinet meeting on Tuesday. According to the Environment Ministry, the law will come into force on March 25th. The bill had been passed by the National Assembly in August to form the legal foundation for South Korea's carbon neutrality goal. This makes South Korea the 14th country to legislate its commitment to become carbon neutral by 2050, joining the likes of Canada, France and the UK. Under the law, South Korea set its nationally determined contribution as 40 percent, meaning that the country aims to slash its greenhouse gases by 40 percent of its 2018 levels by 2030. 
This is higher than the 35 percent target that had previously been passed by the National Assembly. The law also holds both the central and provincial governments to come up with their own plans to contribute to reducing carbon emissions within one year of the bill coming into force. The private sector will join the efforts as there will be a newly formed committee gathering public opinion while overseeing the overall progress. The new law is expected to propel South Korea towards its carbon neutral plan in accordance with the 2015 Paris Agreement by having binding power. The expert also added that supplementary measures to strengthen research and development in renewable energy should follow to help the country maintain a stable source of energy and make coal phase-outs. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Biopharmaceutical company Pfizer said that it has agreed to sell up to 4 million courses of its oral COVID-19 treatment Paxlovy to UNICEF throughout 2022. The deal is aimed at helping ensure timely access to the treatment for low- and middle-income countries. A handful of people gathered near the plane crash site and offered prayers for the victims. They said that they drove nearby the city and wanted to help with relief work but were not allowed into the crash site zone. Nike beat its third quarter revenue and profit estimates, positioning the company to take advantage of surging demand for sports shoes and apparel. The threat of tornadoes and strong thunderstorms loomed over the deep south in the United States a day after the same system produced twisters and destroyed homes and injured several people. Following a large-scale exit from most social media platforms and other commercial ventures, Russia has put blame on media giant Meta in spreading what they claim to be extremist beliefs in an effort to get the company to stop its functioning in the region. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at the Spanish city of Valencia, setting all right giant sculptures made of paper mache during the finale of the Phyllis Festival. Thank you for watching us again. Good night.